Look at chapter 11, verse 1. Here's the main question. I say, then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What ye not but the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession of God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then at this present time, there are also, also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, and it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Now let me ask you a question. Knowing that what we know that Paul is exclusively talking about his kinsmen according to the flesh, okay? So chapter 9 is when it starts in verse, uh, actually verse 3. He says, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So many times you'll hear me say physical Israel or national Israel. Okay? So in chapter 9, he is starting this subject, and he doesn't stop this subject until we reach the end of chapter 11. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, let me ask you a question. What kind of Israel is he talking about? Is he talking about spiritual Israel? Is he talking about physical Israel? I believe he is talking about his kinsmen according to the flesh. Now, something that I want to do today is we're going to go slow. We're going to go methodical through this. I'm going to show you the various viewpoints. Uh, because here's the question. Is God done with Israel? What about Israel? Question mark. I'm going to preface this that a lot of good Baptist scholars throughout the ages, they, they, all, they have various opinions about what this is. And I want to say that I do not make it a test of fellowship. And another thing is, is that I should not be so arrogant as to be dogmatic and unmovable in situations like this where it could be this or it could be that. Amen. Dealing with the details... Now, there is going to be an immutable high point here that we should all walk away with in agreement. There's going to be a couple of those that when we walk away, so what we're doing is we're, we're doing a, a bird's eye view in chapter 9 through 11. The, there is a bird's eye view of the whole content. And then what we're doing is we're going to dive in, we're going to get closer to the ground. It's important that you see the high view and understand how it fits together and then go down into the details. And it's the details that some men differ. So it's not like core doctrine. So I will bring up a couple things. I will bring up natural Israel, sp spiritual Israel, and uh, especially when it comes to the good olive tree and the bad olive tree that we're getting ready to look at. So in chapter 10, we see again that he's talking about physical Israel. And in chapter 11, he is talking about physical Israel. Hath God cast away his people? Uh, well, because it's coming off the cusp. In verse 19 of chapter 10, look at this. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. Now, we all understand that to mean the Gentiles, right? Right? And by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he's not talking about spiritual Israel, is he? To Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And then in verse 1, that's where he goes into, but has God cast away all of these people 
that are disobedient? Has God cast away every natural Jew? And Paul says, God forbid, I'm evidence that he has not. Because I am after the tribe of Benjamin. So, that's what he says. But here in what we need to see is that God saves individuals in people groups, okay? He does not save whole people groups. He does not save whole nations. Before the gospel came to the Gentiles, where was it? It was in Israel. It was in physical Israel. It was in natural Israel. Was every Israelite saved? Was every one of them a child of God and had the covenant of the everlasting promise? Remember how uh, when he came to Abraham and he said that through Isaac shall thy seed be called and he says you shall call his name Isaac and I will establish my everlasting covenant with Isaac and his seed after him. That's what, that's what the promise to Abraham was, that God had established an everlasting covenant through Isaac. Now, here's the thing. All of those Israelites that were born after Isaac and Jacob, were they all partakers of the everlasting covenant? No. No. Because of unbelief. Unbelief. You had to be saved, and then you had to have like faith of Abraham. That's Paul's whole arguments in Romans chapter 4. Uh, what has Abraham found? You know, was he justified by works or justified by grace? So we need to understand that, yes, God chose Israel as a people group to bless as a nation and to bring about the gospel of Jesus Christ through the nation of Israel, but not all Israel were Israel. Look at chapter 9, verse 6. So he says here, chapter 9, verse 6, not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for, well, actually, you know what, to give you a little bit more context, come up to uh, verse 3, for I could, chapter 9, verse 3, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth... Is he talking about physical Israel? Yes. It pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and service of God, and the promises. God chose a nation of Israel to bless and to bring an everlasting covenant through a physical people group but who are the members of the everlasting covenant? Not the physical people group, but the spiritual ones. The ones who had like faith of Abraham. And that's what he says in, in verse 6. Not as though the word of God... Now here, God gave all these promises, but Israel rejected God. Does that mean that God's promises cannot be fulfilled? He made some pretty starch promises, didn't he? And Israel rejected him. What about all those in unbelief? Does that mean, well, I was going to do something for him, but now I can't? No. That's what Paul says. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. So there is a God, there is an Israel that is going to be given all the accomplishments of God's promises. If it's not physical Israel, then what Israel is it? It's the Israel of God. Do you remember how Isaac was chosen? Isaac was chosen by promise, right? Do you remember how Isaac was even born, brought into the world? It was by miracle. Had God not uh, brought Isaac into this world, Isaac would never have been naturally born. Ishmael was born according to the flesh. Ishmael is also the seed of Abraham. But Ishmael was according to the flesh. Isaac is the seed of Abraham, but he is the child of promise. He was born by the Spirit. So the Israel that is getting 
the fulfillment of God's promises are those who have had the circumcision of the heart and not the circumcision. What does he say? In, I think it's Romans chapter 2. Who is a Jew? The Jew is one who is one inwardly, not outwardly, with the circumcision of the flesh, but with the circumcision of the heart. So it just so happens early on, before the gospel went to the Gentiles, that inside of physical Israel, and actually, if you, I don't know if you all have that, you all saved that chart I gave you. If you didn't, I got a few copies up here. Inside of natural Israel, there is God's Israel. And I'm going to call them God's covenant people. That's what I refer to. When I refer to God's covenant people, I'm referring to those where the promises are fulfilled. And who are the ones who the promises are fulfilled? Those are the ones that have the circumcision of the heart. You can be in Israel and be an Israelite and born in the seed and born in the lineage of Israel. You're going to be blessed outwardly because you are given an advantage. You're given the oracles of God and the commands and you were raised as a nation that, that worshiped God. You know, even uh, lost people, the lost people around you are blessed to be around you because it's a blessing. You know, and the Lord is blessing us. He's also, I mean, the rising tide lifts all boats. And, and so the Lord is blessing us. He's blessing others around us. So we see, now back to chapter 11, and this chart, I had you get this chart out. We're, we're going to look at this more. There's no way we're going to reach verse 36. I don't even know if we're going to reach verse 11. I feel like I've done a lot of prep work. You can tell I've been thinking about this all week, right? So I've done a lot of prep work up to this point, but I, I, we need to make sure that we know in these coming up verses that Paul has got a main teaching in view. The bird's eye view is no, God has not cast away the remnant of physical Jews that he will save. That he's saving today but it's kind of a trickle right now. And later on, Paul, we're going to see that Paul gets prophetic. And he's going to say that God, towards the end or at the end, there's going to be a mass swing. It's like a pendulum. There's going to be a mass swing back to the physical nation of Israel where there will be Israelites saved by the gospel. Not a different way. They're not going to reinstitute uh, temple worship and then be saved through temple worship. They're, if they're going to be saved, it's going to be the same way we were saved. It's going to be the same way Abraham was saved. It is by the gospel. It's by the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Paul gets a bit prophetic at the end. That's not the main point of the text. The main point of the text is, what about Israel? Has God, is he done? You know what? You're done. You're, you're like Esau, you, 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 you had your chance, you, you, you uh, squandered your birthright, and there is no more blessing to give you. Paul says, God forbid, because he is one who was saved. He's a physical Israel. He was a, 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 a Jew that was very zealous without knowledge, right? He was persecuting the church and everything. That's the first thing. God is not done because he has a remnant, according to grace. It's by grace. Secondly, Gentiles do not be high-minded. That's the second point. Gentiles, just because the Jews are rejecting the gospel, Paul says they are enemies for your sake. It is through the rejection, and then God has come to the Gentiles to provoke the Jews to jealousy that means that by their rejection, now I don't believe that God, we were plan B. I, you will never hear me say, if you believe the sovereign grace of God and his decrees, there is no plan B. God's not reactionary. He's, he's pro-action, right? So he decrees all things. He can't react. He's immutable. He cannot change. My yes or no is not going to make him do A or B. So 
Um, the fact is, as Paul says, they're enemies for your sake. You better be glad. Because through that fall, through that stumble, through that blindness which God has given them, God has extended mercy to the Gentiles, which has always been a prophecy. It's always been there. That was God's way of extending mercy to the Gentiles. God had used their unbelief to extend mercy to us. So, um, those two things. That God is not finished with the physical Jew and God tells us to not be high-minded but fear. And at the end, there's really three sections to this. The, the, the sections are is what happened to Israel. I think I lost my... Hey, Jason, I lost my vocal here, buddy. All right. So the three sections is what happened to Israel, why it happened to Israel, and what will happen to Israel. What happened to Israel is verses 1 through 7. Why it happened is verses 8 through 24. What will happen is verses 25 through 36. And you know what? I think I just, yeah, I, we got a few minutes. We'll, we'll start. I want to give you the overall view. Let's start with the overall view. And then we'll, we'll dive into verse 11. Verse 11 through 15 will be a bit of review from last week. But uh, as I was studying this this week, we really need to be careful, like I said, and methodical and keep everything in context. Not just this immediate context, but in chapter 9 through verse 11. So verses 11 and 12, he states a general theme. Verse 11 and 12, what has happened to the Jews and why? In verse 11 of Romans chapter 11, he says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So in a general overview, we see in verses 11 through 12, he tells us what has happened to the Gentiles and why it, I mean the Jews and why it happened. And then in verse 15, and then, well, actually verses um, 13 and 14, Paul kind of goes on to his office of the apostleship and that he uh, wants to provoke to emulation his kinsmen according to the flesh. He's still talking about Israel, physical national Israel, Verse 15, he restates the theme that he establishes in verse 11. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? That's the same thing he said in verse 11 and verse 12. So in verse 16 through 17, he gives us the fundamental relationship of the Jew and the Gentile that is in the Christian assembly today that are among God's people. What is our relationship with each other? Verse 16, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. For if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For, God, for if God spare not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. In verses 18 through 21, it's the very specific warning to the Gentiles to not misunderstand our relationship with the Jews. Do not give way to pride. Do not feel we're superior because we came to him by faith instead of works. Um, in verse 22, he sums up of being saved. Verse 23, 
uh, verse 22, he sums it up. Where it before, therefore, uh, behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, there's like kind of a double negative there, shall be grafted in. Meaning, if they believe, they'll be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Verse 23, Paul talks about the possibility of even though the branches were broken off, God is able to graft them in again. So we're going to define what we think the first fruit, the root, the lump, and the branches are, and what the olive tree is. Um, But we're still doing the main overview. So he's saying that there's a possibility... Don't, do not be boastful because God is able to graft those that have been broken off back in again. For if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? He is not talking about the loss of salvation and then the gain of salvation. He's not talking about losing salvation and then being grafted back in. He's not talking about the individuals. He's talking about the people group right here. Who are the branches? Well, he tells us the branches are Israel, natural Israel. And this good olive tree that we see is none other. Now, let's go back to uh, verse 16. Now, maybe next week we'll get a little bit more deeper in this, but I do kind of want to finish what I started here a little bit. The first fruit is understood, now like I said, that this is not a test of fellowship and you may have your uh, position fortified in the word of God that it's something else and you know what? Let's love one another and just agree to disagree with some things and you know, ultimately let God have glory. But I believe the first fruit he's talking about is Abraham. And I believe with, um, there's actually a couple men, Shriner and, and uh, MLJ, uh, they believe that the first fruit, and I tend to agree, like I said, I've been reading this and reading this and reading this, if the first fruit be holy, I believe the first fruit is Abraham and the root. So it's two illustrations of the same truth. A lot of people will want to split that up. They'll say, well, no, the first fruit are the original Jewish believers in the gospel dispensation. And then, but he's not talking about Jewish believers in particular. He's not talking about the Jewish fathers of the faith. He's talking about the patriarch. He's, talk, he's been talking about physical Israel this whole time. So who's he talking about? He's talking about Abraham. For God came to Abraham and blessed him, and then said, Through thy seed all the nations shall be blessed. And God established an everlasting covenant with Abraham. There's not been another covenant. Actually, it's interesting. We may get into this in the 11 o'clock message. But there were two covenants. There was a covenant of works and the covenant of grace. Guess which one came first? The covenant of grace. He came to Abraham. First, way before Moses. And then the covenant of works was after the covenant of grace. And that's what Paul says in Galatians. That covenant of works cannot disannul the covenant of grace. Because Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It was a one-way covenant. God said, believe and watch how I bless. I just believe that I'm going to do this for you. And Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. There was no works. There was no condition of the covenant being met. It was God's one-way covenant. And that's what he even promises. And so all of those who have like faith, and that's what we read in, in Galatians, all those who have like faith of faithful Abraham are the children of Abraham. We're the heirs of the promise. We have been grafted into God's covenant promise. So, here's the thing. 
Now, who's the covenant promised to? We, we talked about that at the very beginning. It wasn't to all physical Israel, was it? No, because not all Israel are Israel. Because if it was all of physical Israel, there's a lot of promises that just bombed. And that's what Paul says, God forbid. The word had taken none effect. He says, well, what if those that didn't believe? Well, let God be true and every man a liar. But to the covenant of the children of promise, those the, the elect of God, the elect Israel within Israel, and then even the elect Gentiles who he grafts into Israel, God's Israel, the ones he did give promises to, and I will take away their sins. He's talking about Jacob. Remember all those promises he gave to Jacob? Well, that is the covenant of promise, the covenant of grace. It's beautiful. The more you dig in here, the more you just start getting things. My, the hardest thing I had to do this week was figure out how to give you what's in my mind in an organized way. And... Um, because it's just like fireworks. Well, look at that one. Look at that one. <laughs> look at that one go off. And it's beautiful, the Word of God. How it all... You will never be ashamed of studying hard. It's just a well that you'll... It's just never going to run dry. And the more you study this, the more you see our great composer of our Lord, the great architect, how he's brought all this together... And the overwhelming truth of anything that you study and you study deep, it is by his mercy. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but it's God that showeth mercy. And whether you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, he is the same Lord over all, and he is rich unto all who call upon him. And... Um, I'm running out of time, and I don't want to go too deep. But I do want to, I hopefully, I'm trying to think if I've left anything dangling there that may need more explanation. But um, actually, yeah, I told you what the first fruit was. So the first fruit, I believed it to be uh, Abraham, the first fruit and the root. It's the, both illustrations are talking about the same thing. For the first fruit, verse 16, be holy. The lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. So the lump being that this lump, the recipient, it's God's covenant people. If, it, if the first fruit be holy, and then the recipients of God's blessings. But what do we read in verse 17? And if some of the branches be broken off. So that right there tells you. This lump and these branches can't be locked in. They can't be in Christ. These must be the recipients of God's promises, whether it's as a nation, it's a covenant people, because if branches are being broken off, that they were broken off, they, they themselves had unbelief and broke off, and thou, being a wild olive tree. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Gentiles. So if he's talking about the Gentiles after that, and thou, then he must be talking about natural Israel being broken off. That's what he's been talking about. The falling away of them being the, the uh, riches of the world. That's what he said in, in verse 12 and, and uh, verse 13 and Verse 14 and verse 15, the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world. The casting away of who? The unbelieving Jews. The ones whose eyes have been darkened. The ones who are in uh, partial blindness. So those are the natural branches. If they were broken off, and so if they're broken off, if natural Jews are broken off from the first fruit in the root, who's the first fruit in the root? You kind of have to work your way backwards. Well, it must be Abraham, who God gave the, the covenant promises to at the beginning. He gave both physical and spiritual promises to Abraham. Okay? And so these Jews were broken off, and he says, and uh, Paul is saying, hey, Gentiles, thou being a wild olive tree, 
were grafted among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. What's the olive tree? The olive tree is God's covenant people. God's covenant people. The spiritual. The Israel. It is God's Israel. It is those who have had the circumcision of the heart. It is the, the recipients of the everlasting covenant. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the everlasting covenant in uh, our 11 o'clock service. Because this everlasting covenant, which God has brought in, if you're saved today, you are in this covenant. You are in. You've been grafted. As a nation, as a people group, we've been grafted in. It's the pendulum. God has, through their rejection, has extended mercy to the Gentiles, and then to provoke, at one point, the, Gentile, the, the Jews, did I say provoke the Gentiles? Provoke the Jews to jealousy, and then he will use that jealousy, and I believe here towards the end, we're going to see a pendulum swing back to the people group. Once the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, we're going to see a swing back, to the people group of Israel, and he says, so all Israel shall be saved. He's not talking about every single Israelite. That's never been the way he has saved people. He has never, just, just like us, he has extended mercy to the Gentiles. Does that mean every Gentile has been saved? No. And then when he extends mercy back to the Israel, does that mean every Israelite will be saved? No. I believe there at the end, so all Israel shall be saved. He's talking about what he has already started, the remnant according to the election of grace. And who is he talking about specifically being the remnant? The elect physical Jew. That's who he's talking about at the end. So all of the elect Jews, now you may have a different opinion about that. Many think that's spiritual Israel. I used to always think that was spiritual Israel. Then all of Israel shall be saved. But there's only one problem, and we'll talk more about it next week. I'm, I'm excited about I just want to keep going. Uh, uh, many believe that's spiritual Israel, but, and it could be. There's a lot of good points. People say, and so all Israel shall be saved. Like, that's all spiritual Israel. And that's true. All spiritual Israel will be saved. Those whose names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life for the foundation of the world... They're going to be saved. But when you look at the context and the thrust of chapter 9 through 11, dig your teeth into what Paul has been talking about this whole time. He has not really brought up in verse 11 spiritual Israel. He has only been talking about the elect physical Jew. The elect of God. Not all of Israel but all of the elect, all of those who are like Paul, who have been born out of due season. Hey, look, God's not done with the physical Jew because I was saved. And who are, who, who's going to, who, is God done with his, his people? Is God done with the natural Jew? No. Just like he said in uh, Elijah, just like he told Elijah, I have a people reserved to myself who have not bowed down to Baal. And that is the remnant according to election. Now, a lot of people have different views of what that looks like. It's either near the coming of Christ or it's at the appearing of Christ. We don't know how many Jews the Lord is going to save. It's either near the end or at the end. But I do believe that as Paul teaches here, and I take it as, as, as honestly as I can with myself, that God will do a work in saving his remnant in the national uh, people group of Israel there towards the end. How many of them? I don't know. But we know that however many he elected unto salvation will be saved. So all of Israel, all of that remnant, all of those, all of those people that Paul's talking about shall be saved. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for those who are here with the hearts to worship and to learn from your word. Father, may we always be honest. May you teach us and guide us. Give us a teachable spirit to be taught. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all the revelation which you give us. And Father, just how, what, 
We just can't be thankful, Father, enough for the grace that you've given us. Lord, thank you for what we've seen today, Father, that salvation is by grace through faith. And thank you, Lord, for uh, saving us. Lord, we pray for the remainder of this morning that you'll be glorified, you'll be lifted up, that your name be exalted, and that you'll be honored. In Jesus' name, amen.